So good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are uh, listening in from. I'm uh, very happy to welcome you to our today's uh, joint webinar from Eurovent, Eurovent Middle East and Eurovent certification on energy efficiency of air handling units in hot and humid climates. Uh, my name is Markus Lattner. I'm the managing director of Eurovent Middle East and also the international director of Eurovent. And I'm uh, very pleased to be moderating this webinar today. Uh, the contents today will be, uh, we will have a technical uh, expertise uh, on energy efficiency in hot and humid climates, the factors which are influencing energy efficiency in, under such conditions. We will then hear about energy labeling for air handling units in such conditions. And have uh, following on that, we will have a technical panel discussions to reflect on the content we have heard. We will have an extended uh, question and answer uh, possibility for you. And in the end, we will summarize the key takeaways. Again, the organizers of this webinar are uh, coming from the Eurovent organization. It's uh, the Eurovent main, Eurovent main association, Eurovent Middle East, Eurovent Certita certification, which is uh, best known for its Eurovent certified performance mark. Our media partner of today is, as always, Climate Control Middle East. Before we start, uh, uh, a few technicalities to begin with. Uh, you are all muted to not interfere with the presentations, but you can ask us questions at any time. You will find this uh, possibility at the control panel on your screen. Uh, to leave the webinar, please uh, just close the, the control panel and you will get uh, the request if you want to leave the webinar. There are today no handouts uh, for download available. However, we will make the presentations available as a PDF uh, and the recordings of the webinar online in a few days time. And you will be notified through email and also through our LinkedIn pages when this is available. I would like to introduce and welcome our speakers of today, uh, starting with Prabhat Pike Girl. He is a technical and industry advisor for Eurovent Solidar Certification, a lecturer at Ishray Institute of Excellence, and has a, a, a quite a tremendous record as a consultant in the Middle East and India. We have with us also Silva Kulte, who is the new president of Eurovent Solidar Certification. Uh, Pedro Lapa, who is co-owner and director of R&D of EVAC in Portugal, and he was also the chairman of the subcommittee for energy labeling within Eurovent Solidar Certification. And last but not least, we also have with us Vanjaj Kaul, who is our country rep representative for India and a well-known public policy professional. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us today. Um, I would like to call on um, PK to join me on screen uh, for his presentation on energy efficiency factors for air handling units in hot and humid climates. Good morning, PK. I Good hope. morning, Marcus. Good morning, listeners. So let me hand over the presentation to you. Okay. There you go. So a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined the presentation today, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. A uh, very special welcome to the delegates and friends from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Dubai, where I've spent 25 years, and also from the authorities in India who are uh, well on to the way to get the air handling unit or the air side uh, specifications and uh, airside things going in a good way. Uh, so far, we have seen energy related work on chiller side, which is 50 to 65 percent of the entire HVAC energy spend. And more and more emphasis today is being put on airside energy spend and that is something which is now catching on due to the very fact that two things are happening right now in the world. One is the energy prices are constantly on the rise. 
and the effects of global warming are showing up. And that necessitates that and tells us that every drop counts. It is not just uh, that we take care of the chiller side or the chill water and energy that we can reduce in their operation, but air side counts a lot. And going ahead, we need to get our air handling units right in order to save as much energy on air side as possible. So what is happening around the world? You can see energy performance of building directive in Europe, which was recast in 2008, talking about energy class, energy efficiency class for summer application of any project under subgroup one. And manufacturers of air handling units in this region and the world over have taken notice of that because a number of projects uh, where these air handling units are actually supplied by people in this region. Let us go ahead and see uh, what are the requirements of a good air handling unit and what is what are the market forces what are the designers the building owners regulators and manufacturers telling us uh, what do they understand they understand very well that air quantities are normally higher than what is required in winter mode and this leads to higher pressure drop within the ag dehumidification requires substantial energy Technologies are today in place uh, so that moisture from fresh air can be taken out with substantially less energy. Similarly, evaporative cooling, wherever possible, can be used to reduce sensible load by doing pre-cooling. Cooling to dehumidify and reheating to meet temperature requirements can produce a lot of waste of energy. Therefore, alternate ways need to be evaluated. Components that are not required and pose a pressure drop can be bypassed to reduce the internal pressure drop. Now, today's webinar, we are talking much about the labeling requirement for hot and humid region. So let us see what the hot and humid region basically means and how does it how does the humid region pose a challenge in front of the building owners and everyone who is into energy control these days so the the <clears throat> sorry the picture on the left hand side is mainly pertains to the hot climate. And you can see a lot of area gets added when we talk about humid climate. And the picture on the right is basically all the areas where humidity poses a major concern and energy requirement on the air handling unit. Let us understand what the building owners are asking us or what are the regulators asking us to do at this point in time? We have all seen uh, in the last few months or last couple of years, increased and in dual ventilation rate requirements being posed by building owners and people who are into designing. Emphasis on compressor-less cooling for applicable periods is on the rise. Uh, places like India, where we want to go out and provide cooling to the masses in hot and dry region with whatever power avail is available to us, uh, needs that we work on evaporative cooling and provide whatever cooling can be provided without the use of compressors. Day by day, we can all see that controls are becoming more and more intelligent and efficient. And use of IoT 
and related controls is going to, at some point of time, get into this air handling unit world and possibly, you know, provide us an air handling unit which will self-adjust itself to use the minimum amount of energy and shift from one mode to the other, uh, looking at energy predominantly. The other thing that the market is, or the specifiers and the regulators are asking is that reheat requirements be handled in a very energy efficient manner. Nobody is willing to spare strip heaters and electrical heaters for any reheat requirements. Similarly, with the increased rate of ventilation, heat exchangers, plate wheels, different types need to be used intelligently in order to bring down the cooling load or the cooling requirements in the first place itself. And we will talk about it in this webinar and the experts who are to come in the next few presentations will go further deeper into things as far as these things are concerned. We need to keep an eye on the internal pressure drops. The internal pressure drops are the responsibility of the manufacturer. The external pressure drops obviously are done by taken care of in field design and uh, they, they sort of want that the internal pressure drops uh, are properly designed by manufacturers and uh, they are labeled properly so that the total pressure drop when seen at site has the lowest component of internal pressure drop possible and things like this in future need to be rewarded that is what uh, the regulators and the market and the building owners are telling us this is more of uh, common sense boardroom talk rather than the other things which becomes a designer talk so let us go ahead and see what is happening around uh, the world and to say all around the world, people are working on these particular kind of things. And uh, here is a slide of what is being done in India by ISHRE uh, under the expert guidance of Dr. Jyotirmay Mathur, a uh, young engineer, Nishan Kipta, has produced a program where evaporative cooling, uh, we can find out in hot and dry region brings in the temperature and humidity of different places. It is location specific, and it tells you out of 8,760 hours, how many hours you can meet an internal temperature and humidity automatically by providing just evaporative cooling. So this is a rough printout of that particular program. And spans then into two-stage cooling, so to say. So we are all aware of two-stage evaporative cooling. First, we basically cool the air and then we humidify it and leave it in space. Again, for hot and dry regions, uh, this could be a great thing to incorporate on the air side air handling units uh, in time to come in order to reduce the load itself. So let us look at what is being done in, in Europe. And Pedro Lapa is today with us. And these are some very, very good inputs that he provided to me. And you can see we can cool down the fresh air in low humidity regions, uh, basically by providing a combination of evaporative cooling and plate heat exchangers and uh, up front, we can bring down the amount of energy that you need to spend on your fresh air. And these good things uh, are coming in, will come in, have, have to come in at some point of time or the other different company countries are taking it at different paces. So again, a sensible wheel, the energy recovery in that of the sensible heat, enthalpy wheel, uh, you then have enthalpy wheels or hygroscopic wheels, which take out more amount of moisture up front. 
And uh, if you look at all the wheels on a same on a single graph, you see that they create different pressure drops uh, in for the airstream, and that is important because with different pressure drops, uh, we have different amount of power being utilized in order to overcome that pressure drop on that particular wheel. Going ahead, uh, some studies have been done in India and other places with various combinations of entering dry bulb and wet bulb temperature that exists in different parts of the country. And uh, some places are low RH, we call them hot and dry, some places are high RH, so the temperature does not go that high, but the humidity goes much higher. And uh, when we run a 8,760 hours analysis on these particular things, uh, we find that the energy spent is different with different pressure drops, and not all kinds of wheels come out to be the same thing. The same uh, the same energy consumption and uh, this is what is telling us that it needs uh, a very close look at these particular things and the programs the software which comes out and generates these particular or does the selection of these air handling units need to incorporate things like the weather data today it's available from ASHRAE, from other sources for around the globe. So softwares have become much more powerful. They can incorporate the weather data of almost every city in the world and provide you an analysis with the wheel characteristics as to what kind of, uh, which comes out to be the winner. So, Prediction of energy efficiency is not dependent on components only. I'm to say you can have a component listed in any of the certified sites, but you need a overall holistic number uh, depending, taking into account the local conditions, uh, the air velocity and the spacing arrangement resulting in different pressure drops and in time to come, uh, intelligent use of IoT is going to come in and bypass samples are going to be controlled probably automatically and uh, make sure that the least amount of energy spent is done for providing the cooling and the fresh air to different places in different regions. So if you recall, we had done a webinar on filters and we had shown how different filters can have different efficiencies for the same pm level required and uh, there are other factors which go into air handling unit design like high fi high fan efficiency grades we are seeing how fan efficiency grades are changing now types of fan motor and efficiency class we see improvement and there are a lot of things that are being done on air side today in order to improve the efficiency of the air side system as a whole so we also plan a webinar on energy recovery and energy efficiency uh, of air handling units sometime end of may 2022 the purpose of that would be to explain these values pat and pah that you see on your screen this is quite a complex task and not achieved in a webinar like today's uh, in an hour or two it would probably need what is called a workshop with uh, so many people over there and uh, people holding hands and taking you through the process of selection the process of understanding how different wheels produce different pressure drops i'm sure pedro will be able to 
answer any questions today that you have in this particular regard. Uh, he was the chairman of the subcommittee, which came in and did all this good work. So coming to the fundamentals, the factors influencing energy consumption have to be taken on board. People will talk about uh, airflow and external static pressure. But what I would like to emphasize as a designer and as a person who's keenly involved with net zero process and with carbon neutrality and things like that is that we require the energy class of good air handling units to be shown separately in databases or on printouts of uh, selection programs with adequate justification so that going ahead, uh, building owners can decide in their owner project requirements, the OPRs, as to what they are targeting in terms of energy efficiency for their whole building. So with that, I would like to share with you the screen from uh, what is being done in India, Ishre Rama standard. It has also taken uh, both mechanical performance and thermal performance into consideration. And heat recovery system has already been uh, sort of added into it in order to arrive at the overall performance value. So it's basically the pressure drops, the fan efficiencies, the thermal performance, and heat recovery, and air velocity, which are all going into the formation of these standards as of today. And uh, hopefully, it will show up in the region and expand globally, along with what is being done in Europe. So here is the energy label that uh, Eurovent has come out with. You can see on the left hand on the left hand uh, uh, label uh, snowflake, and on the right hand label the sign of the sun, which tells you basically that one is the winter condition, the other is the summer condition, and uh, the differences will be brought out by the methodology of this, and the differences will be brought out by the speakers who come in, uh, the experts who come in next on these particular things. And with that, I would like to sign off and I'll be there for the question and answer session along with the others to take on any questions that may be there for basically the philosophy of this particular thing uh, that we are trying to put forward in order to save the last bit of energy. So Marcus, over to you for the rest of the presentations. I'll be there for the uh, question answer session and uh, the panel that we have at the end. Thank you. Thank you, PK. I greatly appreciate uh, your contribution and we continue and move on to the next uh, topic, which is, uh, as PK already uh, said, uh, we are talking now about energy labeling for air handling units in hot and humid climates, the methodology and how it is applied to. And I would like to welcome uh, Sylvain Corté uh, with me. Good morning, Sylvain. Good morning and good afternoon. I will hand over the remote control to you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Marcus. So um, my name is Sylvain Coté. I am the president of Eurovent Satita Certification, and I will present you um, the new um, energy efficiency label for air units for hot and humid climates. So um, I will start with some uh, basic facts and figures about Eurovent Satita Certification, and then explain. Uh, why it is important to um, rely on third-party certification. 
Uh, then I will explain uh, the, the principle and how work this um, hot and humid climate uh, energy classification for any unit. And then we will uh, have a, a short uh, explanation on how it works uh, with our website and how you can uh, find the relevant information. So first regarding European SATITA certification, um, I will quickly explain some uh, some key facts. Uh, so uh, ECC is a third party certification body. So we are an independent body focused only on certification of products. Uh, we are accredited according to ISO 17065 um, and we are applying the scheme 5 which is the highest level defined in the uh, ISO standard. We um, manage almost 50 certification programs and we have a team of 60 uh, permanent, permanent people dedicated to certification and we speak uh, uh, about 10 languages in our team. So here you will see some um, uh, key figures about our activity. Um, of course, European Satita certification comes from Europe and we are um, largely present uh, in Europe. We estimate that we cover about two thirds of the European market, meaning that two thirds of the products which are um, supplied to the European market are European certified. Our activity represents about 1,600 tests in independent laboratories uh, per year and about 400 audits per year. Uh, we have uh, uh, around uh, more than 50,000 uh, references uh, certified and our uh, data, certified data are available uh, 24 hours per day and seven days per week on our website. Our activity covers more than uh, 200 manufacturers. So we are certifying all the products um, in the HVAC and R um, industry. Um, we are certifying products in the ventilation fields like air handling units, air filters, heat recovery systems, air cleaners in the indoor climate uh, fields like rooftops, VRF, chillers, air conditioners, but also in the process cooling and food cold chain, uh, for example, the display cabinets and the cooling towers or the heat exchangers. Um, basically, how does it work? Um, our certification activity is an annual process. It means that every year, some evaluations have to be done. Uh, basically, we uh, manage uh, tests in independent laboratories where we compare the measured values with the declared values from the manufacturers. Um, we are mainly using independent laboratories. Uh, this is a key aspect of our activity. Uh, we also have production, production site audits. Uh, which implies sometimes some corrective actions and assessment from uh, ECC of the uh, uh, efficiency of these corrective actions. And um, we have a set of general rules uh, that are in our certification manual. And also for some programs, we do have the check of the selection tools whenever it is applicable. And this is the case for the earning unit program, which is uh, our subject today. So here you have the, the three pillars of our certification activity. Um, you have the tests done in laboratory and mainly in independent laboratories. We are working with a set of uh, different independent laboratories uh, in Europe, uh, covering uh, all the, uh, uh, the products that we are certifying and we rely on the best laboratories available. Uh, we also rely on factory audits this is to ensure that uh, what is tested uh, in the independent laboratories are the same products as the ones that are delivered to the customers. And also it allows us to verify that there is a consistency of 
um, the characteristics of the products that are manufactured uh, by the manufacturer along the years. It's not a one-off certification. We uh, check that um, what has been tested uh, uh, during a, a year uh, is produced with the same, in the same way and with the same performances afterward. And also for some programs, uh, we rely on selection software checks. Um, you may know that more and more uh, for B2B products, especially products can be uh, configurable, can be very different. Um, they are produced uh, against uh, customer specifications. And this is the case for handling units, but also for chillers. Uh, and um, more and more manufacturers do provide um, selection software printouts to their customers. And those printouts include uh, specific performances of the product that are very um, special to the project uh, that is of interest for the customer. Okay. Um, I have an issue in uh, the slide. Can you, Marcus, help me? Thank you very much. Okay, sorry, there is some latency uh, in the computer, so now I think it's working. Okay, so our certification programs are relying uh, and are recognized by uh, different organizations. For example, the EVO organization, which is managing the IP MVP protocol, is relying on third-party equipment certification and is, um, I would say, referring to uh, our activity. Then, um, why third-party certification is important? Um, today, um, you have basically on the market self-declaration which is basically uh, how you rely on performances if there is nothing existing. Um, sorry, there is a, a little bit of problem on the, on the screen, but I will explain uh, what I mean. Self-declaration uh, do not allow to, uh, let's say, to rely on performances because you rely only on uh, the performance that are declared uh, by the manufacturers. And so there is a, a potentially a no verification of the performances. When you rely on self-declaration, uh, you can rely only on market surveillance authorities to check the performance of the product. And we know that especially for B2B product, sometimes it is difficult to, uh, let's say, to, uh, to cover all the performances and all the products. Uh, for uh, these P2P products. Then a second step uh, would be to rely on um, test factory uh, uh, factory test from the participant. So you could rely on a specific test, uh, but this test is coming from, uh, let's say, the, uh, the manufacturers. So um, th there is an issue in terms of uh, impartiality. Uh, even if it's better than self-declaration. A third step would be to rely on uh, one-off uh, tests made by uh, independent laboratories and better by accredited laboratories according to ISO 17025. But again, uh, here there is a risk that the product that has been tested in the independent laboratory um, is a uh, specific and not representative of the production uh, of uh, the manufacturer. So the best level of confidence that you could have is really based on third-party certification 
which is accredited according to ISO 17065 and uh, which is uh, uh, what uh, ECC is doing. Um, so Marcus, maybe I need your help because um, I don't see on the screen the presentation. Hello, Marcus. Okay, maybe there's a problem for the display of the presentation. Yes, Eric. Yes, Silva. There's a error on the on sharing the the PPT. Give us a second. Okay. Can you try Vantage to to show the presentation? Yes, I'm trying on my end. Give me a second. Okay. So basically, uh, I will continue with my presentation. Um, the benefits of third-party certification. Um, provides trust to the market, uh, accuracy of the performances, but also comparability. Um, Third-party certification allows you to compare the products, different products from the different manufacturers. Um, and they, um, the different products from the manufacturers uh, so that uh, it allows the customers to uh, compare the different products with each other. And then it provides um, savings to the end users. So sorry, uh, Marcus is calling me. So yes, uh, please apologize for this um, problem. Um, we had a, there was a, a technical problem uh, to present uh, the file. So I'm, by the, the time Vanchage is managing to uh, present um, the document, I will go through the, the presentations. Um, so basically, uh, if we talk about our certification program for earning units, uh, we do certify um, performances for both the model box, but also for the real units. For the, the model box, we do certify uh, mechanical characteristics like casing strength, casing air leakage, filter bypass leakage, casing thermal transmittance, thermal bridging factor, and acoustic insulation. For the real units, we do certify uh, the performances that are provided in the printout, 
um, like air flows, available pressure, absorbed power, uh, sound performance levels also, uh, heating and cooling capacity uh, of the coils, energy recovery, and pressure loss on the water side. So um, we, we have been certifying AHUs for many, many years. It started in 1998. And since then, we have developed different programs uh, to certify the different components that are inside the earning units, like the heat recovery systems, the filters, the coils, um, ducts also, and the fans. We developed a certification program for hygienic units uh, recently, 2017. And, also, and recently, we developed this summer application for uh, a earning units. Okay, I see that Marcus uh, managed to um, join again. Yes, um, so. very, very thankful to everybody. Uh, but my system has crashed and I was not able anymore to interfere with the and, and handle the, uh, the screen. So I had to go out and uh, make myself a new organizer. I'm very, very sorry for this. Uh, uh, mishap. Can so you tell me worry. where? So, yes, by, by that time I keep going with the presentation and I am now in slide 24. 24. So mm -hmm. yes, I I was explaining the different steps that uh, led us to uh, being able to certify the air units for hot and humid climates. Um, basically today we are certifying 140 AHUs um uh for sorry 140 manufacturers h manufacturers in the world and we managed to um build this scheme for the summer label based on ashray climate climate database uh, based on more than 4000 cities in the world so basically um yes so if you can go to the next slide please Sorry so, no, no problem, uh, Marcus. Thank you very much. Um, so basically, um, how do our uh, energy efficiency classification work? Uh, here you have the principle for the um, the original scheme for winter application. So in this scheme, uh, you will see that it, it relies on four different parameters. First, the air velocity. Um, uh, in the early unit, the heat recovery efficiency, the heat recovery pressure drop, and the fan efficiency. So all these parameters have to be assessed in order to define the final energy uh, class. Um, what is interesting in this scheme is that um, all these parameters um, have a, a value and are important and can compensate each other because uh, you could be good on the first parameter uh, and not that good on the second, but um, the first one could compensate the second one um, because everything is related to energy. So how does it work? Uh, how to compare the heat recovery efficiency and um, the pressure drop uh, in the AHU? Um, if you go back to the previous slide, um, Marcus, yes. So you see in the in the graph that there is um, some studies have been done, um, some energy uh, efficiency uh, calculation have been done for um, many many different projects and locations, where um, you can see in this that uh, you have the pressure efficiency factor, which is defined on the y-axis and which is based on the um, design outdoor temperature in winter. Um, this is uh, how it has been done in, in Europe. And in this graph, for example, you could see that um, if you are at minus 10 degrees uh, Celsius outdoor, it means that uh, one percentage of efficiency more in your heat recovery system is equivalent to 15 Pascal less in your system. So this factor allows uh, you to uh, make the link between um, the heat recovery efficiency and, for example, the, the pressure drop of the components. So in this way, you can compare all these parameters and 
uh, have as a result the uh, overall classification. So if you go to the next slide, you will see the, the table which defines the different energy efficiency classes. Uh, so you have different thresholds for the four parameters, air velocity, heat recovery efficiency, heat recovery pressure drop, and fan efficiency. So um, if all these parameters are according to this table, you will find the uh, corresponding class. But you have to understand that um, you can have some compensation between the different parameters in order to, re to reach a certain class. So this is for the winter application. Now for hot and humid climate, um, we the, the idea was to have an independent label label keeping the current uh, energy efficiency classification for heating and create a new one for the cooling. So the, the same methodology is applied as for the winter application. And in this case, um, the input data are the summer outdoor design conditions. And for that, uh, we use the ASHRAE database and we uh, chose specific conditions uh, regarding outdoor um, uh, temperature uh, for dry bulb and uh, wet bulb. Uh, next slide, please. So here you have the description for the uh, hot and humid climates. Um, what has been added is to uh, take into account the heat recovery system, wet efficiency, so to take into account uh, humid climate. And you still have the heat recovery system for dry efficiency, but in this case, this is in a cooling mode. And here you see the different uh, figures for the different energy efficiency classes. What can be said uh, on these different classes is that it is very difficult to reach A plus normally. Um, it's um, difficult to evaluate it, but uh, our target when we developed this scheme was that not much than 1% of the unit could reach A plus and not much than 5% um, of the unit could be A. So um, those characteristics are quite uh, strong um, to be uh, considered. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here you have a comparison between the two schemes. Uh, on the left side, you have the winter efficiency. On the right side, you have the hot and humid climate uh, system, where you see that we have added the uh, energy recovery uh, for on wet efficiency. Next slide, please. And here you have the different labels. So on the left side, the winter label, and on the right side, the summer label. So you have uh, two, two labels for uh, a, a unit. And depending on the regions, it is mandatory or not to display the summer label. Uh, we have defined what we call the subgroup one, uh, which defines the hot and humid climates. And for this subgroup one, it is mandatory to provide the uh, energy classification in summer conditions. So to, to give you a, a, a vision of uh, where it is mandatory to use this label, you have here a, a map where um, per country, there is an assessment of the percentage of cities or locations that are in subgroup one. Um, if the country is in red, it means that all, uni all cities, all locations are in subgroup one, meaning that the summer application is mandatory. If you are in a green country, it means that uh, no uh, city, no location, um, uh, for no city and no location, it is mandatory to use the summer label. However, you can use it if you want it to but there is no obligation. And for countries in between, and the yellow one, uh, about 50% of the locations um, are in subgroup one, meaning that uh, you have to use the summer label uh, if you want to display certified data. Next slide, please. So, um, we, 
we said that uh, what is important for the energy performance of AHU in hot and humid climate in cooling mode, um, and it, this was explained by PK before, is the humidity recovery. So this is already in place in our system, but also some additional uh, parameters are important. Indirect adiabatic cooling and bypass mode are some important parameters. However, they are not yet uh, taken into account in this label and they are the objects of uh, current studies that are ongoing and uh, we will improve uh, the label and we will include this, uh, the two last points in the future. Next slide please. So yes, humidity recovery um, is important um, and this is already covered uh, in the scheme. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, we plan also to uh, uh, include indirect adiabatic cooling in, uh, in the system to reward the systems that are using uh, this phenomenon to, um, to help uh, decreasing the temperature uh, indoor. And uh, next slide, uh, we also plan to include the effect of the bypass mode. Um, the bypass mode allows to bypass the heat recovery system when it is not needed and then to save some energy because the pressure drop uh, will uh, decrease. So again, this is a, a work ongoing uh, within our uh, technical committee. So then I will try to uh, uh, show you, um, um, let's say, how to use um, this uh, label and how uh, you can check the validity of this label on our website. So here you have the link of our website uh, and then I will uh, show you directly on my screen how to use uh, this. So, um, Marcus, yes. Okay. Okay, Marcus, can you see my screen? I can, yes. Please go ahead. Okay, do you see my um, the website? Yes. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Okay, good. So here you have the Eurovent certification website where you can select um, the product family that you are looking for. So today we are uh, looking at earning units and you select a product type uh, to get some performances. So um, a first step could be to have a pre-selection of the units that you want to, uh, to select. So here you have the list of all the brands that are certified, so there are a lot. Um, in total, we have 730 model box uh, certified. You have the different range names here. And you have the possibility to fine tune your, your selection based on some criteria. For example, if you are interested in uh, uh, model boxes that have the best in class or in terms of casing strengths, uh, you can select, for example, the D1 model boxes and then you get a short list of uh, the products that are compliant with this criteria. And you can play with the different parameters to make a pre-selection of the units or the brands uh, that could provide um, certified AHU uh, considering your requirements. Then um, you could uh, contact those uh, brands and um, define your project and then normally you should receive from them uh, printouts uh, of uh, AHUs that correspond to um, your design conditions, uh, outdoor temperatures, outdoor humidity, external static pressure, and so on. And these printouts are uh, provided by the selection software of the participant. And ECC is certifying those selection software so you can rely on the performances that are provided in this software. What is important to know is that the energy efficiency class of an AHU will not appear on our website because it is project dependent. It will depend on your project and on the configurators 
of the manufacturers. However, the energy class will be given in the printout of the section software coming from the manufacturer. And you can check the validity of this printout by checking on our website if the software name and the software version of the um, uh, selection tool of the manufacturer is uh, actually certified. So how do you check that? Uh, for example, here you have a list of model boxes. Uh, if you know uh, the name, the brand, you can define the brand uh, here. Uh, if you know the range, you select the range. And then you can check uh, the different units that are certified. And here you can see what is the software name and the software version uh, of the participant. So you can check in the, if the printout corresponds to the same software name and version that is listed on the website. And then uh, you could trust the data of the printout. If you still have a, a doubt about uh, what is provided to you, you also have uh, the possibility to send us a request, a direct request uh, through our website using this um, icon here on the top right of the website, which is the access to the certificate checker. And here you have a form where you can um, ask your question and ask for clarity regarding a printout or a model that you are looking for. And we will uh, uh, give you uh, an answer within uh, two working days in order to ensure you that uh, what you received is certified or not. So I think that's all with my uh, presentation, Marcus. Um, should I need uh, to present something else or we can go, go on with the I think next presentation? Uh, thank you very much, yes. And I apologize once more for this technical fault, uh, which left me quite un <laughs> useless on my side, unfortunately, for, for a couple of minutes. So um, thank no you. Worries. And uh, we can go and continue to the uh, technical uh, panel discussion and I would like to invite now all the uh, speakers of today to join me online and switch on your webcam and your uh, microphones please. So once again to both <laughs> uh, for your for your presentations. Now um, I would like to go first of all to, to Pedro. Pedro, you have been the chairman of the subcommittee who was developing uh, the, this hot and uh, humid uh, label. Um, can you perhaps give us um, um, a short um, in impression of how this work was done, uh, what motivated this work and uh, what in your mind are the, the biggest strengths for that? Yes, yes. Good morning. Is working my mic? Yes, it was. Yes. yes. Hey, good morning, good afternoon. Here, you know, it's Port I'm in Portugal, so in the West, so it's really morning. <laughs> so, uh, but answering your question, so the the motivation was the the needs to have a classification similar to the winter winter season for the summer, because we know uh, that the, the summer is completely different. The, the, the heat recover solutions and the design of the units for climate zones need to be different than the units designed for winter seasons. So uh, this was more or less the, the, the reason that uh, uh, we, the manufacturers and the Europa, of course, uh, find to, to be the, the main reason for, for development, the, the the energy labeling for summer. Okay, um, and I understood that the so the core item in this in this label is actually the selection software, correct? This is the, this is the part where where the data of the of the uh, the climatic data has been implemented. So every selection software yeah. is using those data, and that the, the energy classification now is specifically. Uh, given for the location and the configuration of a product of an air handling unit uh, in, the, in the project where it's applied to. Exactly. So the, the, 
to be fair, the, 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 the calculations and the labeling, we choose to, 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 to use a, um, a data, a climate data, that would be the same for all of us and in an easy way to, to have it and to, to have a, that database, a user database, we, we applied uh, as by database climate. Thank you. Uh, PK, um, as in, in your experience, you have been, uh, you're, you're looking back on uh, years of work in, uh, in the Middle East and in India. Um, what were your experiences in the past with energy efficiency and with air handling units in such climates and such conditions and how such a label makes a difference? Okay, so I visited uh, Jeddah on certain occasions where air handling units were right next to the sea, as humid as it gets. And uh, one of the things that we noticed on one of the sites was that there was moisture on top of the unit itself and uh, the design was done correctly. But uh, there were fan coil units installed in that air handling unit room to first remove the moisture that was around it, and those were not switched on. And so the TV value, the thermal transmittance becomes very, very important in uh, units which are kept offshore. I'm to say, you know, Eurobent units I have seen and we have installed offshore and uh, on islands and things like that and you really need them to be robust uh, so that you don't have moisture ingress on the unit that's part one which is basically the casing but when it comes to the climates that you see uh, right from iraq to kuwait to bahrain saudi arabia oman and uh, uae and why not many parts of India, we have fresh air temperatures which are certainly much higher than what you see in Europe or in Turkey or in in-between climates. And here we are being told that, uh, you know, you need to put in extra ventilation in order to meet the, the requirements, the health requirements which were posed just some time back. People keep pushing up and up the fresh air requirements. And really we see in space that unless we push up the, health, the, the fresh air requirements, we don't get the desired CO2 levels and indoor air quality. And it is really important that we pre-cool by using methods which are not really compressor oriented. Now, most jobs in these particular regions, if you separate the room load and the fresh air load, you will find that people are having to install huge chiller capacities in order to meet the fresh air loads. And it becomes really part of airside design to incorporate very simple heat exchangers or heat wheels in order to reduce the intake air temperature of air, especially when fresh air is concerned. And uh, it's good to see it becoming a part of uh, labeling, not only in Europe, but around the world. Just like in India, we did studies for six different regions. I can see uh, Silva's presentation where uh, the area one has been defined and uh, I hope in future people will take more care uh, in order to put in these particular things to reduce the fresh air load up front. And uh, that should certainly form a part of labeling. And uh, that's been my experience with air handling units in all these areas. Thank you, Marcus, over to you. Thank you, PK. Um, then the, the factors, we've heard that the, the three main factors which, which make a, a big impression on uh, energy efficiency would be the energy recovery system, adiabatic uh, cooling, and the bypass mode. So see, looking, at, looking at energy recovery, um, Europe uh, has made energy recovery already uh, compulsory, mandatory. Uh, how is that uh, for, for countries in the Middle East? Uh, for, for any country in, in hot and humid climate. Shall we, uh, are regulators, authorities advised that they would mandate this uh, 
like like in Europe that we that we have to use energy recovery. Uh, Sylvain, maybe you can. Okay. Um... On this point, um, Europe, I, I think, is uh, in advance uh, and uh, is really serious in terms of energy uh, efficiency. However, um, uh, even in Europe, um, there were some debates about this uh, because sometimes, and especially for southern countries, uh, to impose a heat recovery system might not be the best solution in all the cases. And I will. Uh, uh, let Pedro Lapa explain in details why, because he's, uh, he knows uh, about it very well. So um, already in Europe, it was uh, there was some debate about him imposing heat recovery uh, systems with uh, um, a minimum limits. Um, I think the approach that um, is the, the Eurovent approach is maybe more um, consistent uh, because it's an holistic approach which takes into account uh, all parameters, the air speeds, the heat recovery efficiency, um, the heat recovery pressure drop, um, the fan efficiency, and all these have to be considered. Um, so if something has to be done, maybe I would suggest that it relies on a method which is more or less aligned with uh, what Eurovent has been doing and now it is possible to also have a method for hot and humid climate. So uh, I would suggest to these uh, authorities uh, to, to look at this method and maybe to, to get uh, some uh, inspiration. Thank you. Um, Pedro, a question on yes. um, heat recovery first. How do you see, um, is heat recovery really uh, like, um, one of the main stones for that in hot and humid climates? Yes. So, um, what we are what we are doing about the the I will answer to you, but maybe not so directly as you expect. But give me some time. <laughs> what we are doing in the in the in the label in summer labeling with Europa is using three different approach because the climate is very different. Okay, for the humidity zones. Is the ones that we already development uh, and is recover the energy latent uh, with with a wheel or, or some plates special plates that are, is starting to to exist so uh, it recovers plates so uh, like that but there is different uh, places too that are not so humidity but uh, are but need to to we, we need to, to find a way to reduce the energy consumptions in the units, okay? So when that way could be the indirectic adiabatic cooling, uh, that would be very useful in dry places, okay? When the climate is dry, so we need to, to increase the delta T between the inside and outside. So doing the indirectic adiabatic cooling, we promote that and the, another solution is is the the bypass mode in the in the recover component because as an example here in portugal uh, we we are the, one of the most uh, hot climates in europe but but not so hot we have big uh, middle stations uh, okay so between summers and winter is a big period and in that climate, the bypass is very useful because we, we, what we need is reducing the pressure drop in the units to save energy. Okay, so in the end, when all of them be be ready and used, will be for sure uh, very good tools for the designers to choose a equipment for the places that are doing the the, the project. But Mark, the about question, I think that I answer it when you. When I talk about the rotary, no. Um, I so as I understand it, that uh, the the heat recovery, especially through through uh, uh, rotary wheels, is more uh, related than to humidity. Exactly. Yes. Um, do you do you have differences in components when we talk about like when we uh, talk about uh, equipment which should go to hot and humid climates? Uh, do we do we need to think about different components, the different materials, in order to accommodate the the harsher conditions? 
Uh, is to me the question, Marcos? Peter, uh, you're, I yeah. think you're... Oh, yes, okay. Uh, I don't understand very well the question, sorry, about the constructions of the unit or about the the kind, the type of the rotary? No, the, 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 when we talk about the product itself, uh, so the, uh, the air handling unit will be yes. shipped or used in hot and humid climates. Do we need, uh, from a manufacturing point of view, do we need to give different materials, different, do we consider different components in order to accommodate uh, harsher environments? Is this, does that make a difference on the on the unit itself in in form of uh, materials used or yes. components? Okay, uh, I think that I leave this question for the designers and is and for the 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 environment where the unit is installed, depending if it's inside, if it's outside, close to the sea, far away from the sea. So it's not a direct answer to you, depending of the project, you know. But of course, with, with condensations inside of the unit, need to be we need to take some cares about that. Right. But thank you. Okay. I have uh, a question to you, Sir Van. That is, uh, how do we define hot and humid climates? Uh, what are the thresholds for that? Um, what temperatures do we look at? What humidity levels do we look at? When we say hot and humid, what what does that mean? Okay, uh, that's uh, that's a, a tricky question. I don't have the figures in mind, but um, basically there are three main three criteria that uh, were used to define if uh, um, a location is in subgroup one. We take into account the dry uh, temperature, uh, the humid temperature in summer, so the maximum uh, that you could have. Also, also we look uh, at the, the winter conditions. If the winter conditions are quite uh, high, uh, we could say that the, the unit could go in this uh, subgroup one. So um, it's defined in our reference document. Uh, uh, what are the, the specific uh, figures? Uh, I don't have it uh, in mind right now, uh, but uh, basically there are three criteria that are taken into account in order to, to make sure if a location is uh, in this uh, subgroup one. Mm -hmm. Do we do we test it according to uh, a specific temperature set point? No, no. Uh, well, yes. Um, basically, the the European standard is um, uh, defining some uh, some temperatures that are um, that are defined. Uh, so uh, yes, there, there are some uh, standard conditions that are that are used for for this uh, for this test. And do you know them by heart? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe Pedro, you can help me on, on that one for for the summer conditions. You so <laughs> when you said that it's a tricky question, is it a really tricky question? Because there is a lot of uh, people trying to define where is humid and not humid. So uh, yes. when when we did this 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 uh, this job, we starting to try to to find. We we read about Copen Co uh, work um, that is a, a, a Copen Geiger climate. Uh, so he tried to to make a map where is the zones and did it. But in the end, what we used was a, a temperatures and dew points uh, temperatures to define uh, the 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 place to. To be used the uh, humidity humidity recover okay so but answering to you that you ask me the temperatures let me look i have to to, to check in the documents give me one second please so the 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 labeling the labeling system as now because we are only with one step the, the humidity recover is for the dry winter is for for the the bowl the temperature dry bowl in summer bigger than 30 de degrees and winter bigger than minus three degrees or the dew point temperature higher than 17 degrees and winter bowl temperature higher than minus three and 
the last condition is dry bulb temperature higher than 30 degrees and dew point temperature higher than 70. But that is in, in the documents in, in the table that uh, uh, conditions. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for you, uh, sorry, TK. Uh, uh, um, yeah. One of our one of our attendees uh, wants to know how can uh, air handling units help to reduce or to control relative humidity inside uh, supermarkets in the Middle East? Okay, so what I have seen in the United States is the supermarkets have two separate sections. One is the fruit and vegetable section and the other is the normal section where you have toiletries and all the other products, household products and things like that. Now, the household products or the toiletries region is treated exactly like indoor cooling for comfort and say office air conditioning or other things. There is no much moisture ingress over there. But when you come to the areas where produce is kept, then you need to install heat wheels or hygroscopic wheels in order to take the moisture out before it goes into the cooling coil. And that is predominantly used over there. I'm sure it has been tried out in some of the carry fours and other supermarkets in the Middle East also. One of the best examples of this that I had seen was in Howard where they had a stadium, indoor stadium, and they had this particular unit hanging from the roof. So if you give me uh, this participant's email ID, I will send him a lot of literature because it's quite detailed on how to handle humid environments in supermarkets in the Middle East. Once again, I really like, I'm just uh, digressing a little bit. I really like what Petro said about the bypass, that there are enough in between regions in any part of the world over here or in the Middle East where outside temperatures are pretty good. You know, cold winter nights, the shamal wind and things like that. And that is really the time you don't need all this humidification, dehumidification. The bypass mode is the best working mode. Now, some places, they just stop everything. You know, they say that everything is fine, no need for air conditioning. But in today's environment, when we are talking so much about air filtration, you know, for meeting the indoor hygienic requirements, you have to keep the air on. And at that point of time, it will be the bypass mode that will work. If you look at ASHRAE 90.1, then ASHRAE 90.1 classifies the whole Middle East and India and other places as region zero or region one. And it doesn't, it says, uh, it says economizers are not mandatory. And that's why you didn't see much of economizer operations in the Middle East or in India. But there are specific regions in all these parts which could do very well with the economizer. And even in supermarkets, you know, uh, supermarkets have become 18 hour operation. They are no longer 12 hours and things like that. And comes the winter in Middle East, where you have to keep the air on and uh, you don't know what to do. It's much better to bypass all this, reduce the pressure drop, supply the air into the space. And then comes the intelligent controls, which are moving in today. You know, air handling units in time to come will become as intelligent as any other machine. And they will kick on different modes as and when required. So I hope, Marcus, I've answered your question on this particular thing. Thank you. Um, then another question from uh, the audience. Um, what reference standard is used for the efficiency testing of air handling units of Eurovent? Silvia, I think this is for you. Yes. The, um, we have uh, our certification program for air handling unit um, uh, has uh, what we call a technical certification rules, uh, which defines how the certification program is uh, running. 
and in this document uh, we have detailed all the um, let's say uh, the system uh, which uh, enables to calculate the energy uh, efficiency classification so it's a specific uh, let's say calculation method which is related to um, the European certification program for earning units uh, but of course we also rely on testing methods uh, that are uh, referred in European standards so basically EN 13053 for earning units and EN 1886 for uh, model box. But for AHU energy efficiency classification, it's a specific uh, document uh, made by Eurovent and related to the to the certification program. Thank you. Um, another uh, question from the audience. My question is regarding energy labeling. Low air velocities mean a higher footprint and also higher costs. How do the building owners and regulatory bodies look at it? Well, this is, I think, something maybe uh, PK you can um, try to uh, to to assess. Uh, we, of course, we are not building owners ourselves and regulatory bodies, but let's see what you what what do you think about. See, this is this is where the expertise comes. You know, you separate the hay from the chaff and things like that. You bring out the good versus the mediocre. I'm to say, it is a known fact that low air velocities create less pressure drop. And comes the problem of uh, footprint and things like that. Good designers take this into account. Today, what are we faced with? We are mainly faced with two challenges. Energy and indoor air quality. If you look at the cost, I'm to say you wouldn't you would be surprised to see that a good office building or space in India costs as much as a good office space in France. You know, the prices are the same. And if you are talking about uh, $250 per square feet as the best outer outer cost for a good office building, the air conditioning and all these things is not taking more than 10. You know, even 10 is too much. People in US, they used to talk about two and say, I'm going from two to 10. So guys, it's, it's, it's penny wise pound foolish to install small equipment above the ceiling, which you will rip out in three years and send it and again do it rather than be a good designer, provide these particular spaces, these footprints, and good equipment installed in a good way in the Middle East and India lasts 20 years. And so I can take you to air handling units in, the, in Dubai, which are more than 20 years old, and they are still there. You know, double skin units, which came from Europe from very, uh, renowned sources and things like that and replace those single skin units and things like that uh, probably installed in the 80s you would still find them so my answer to this would be go by the low air velocity find the space when you look at the overall cost and the project the life cycle cost you know it would come out a winner and in fact the next project on globally is going to be on life cycle cost analysis. I'm sure Silva will, and everyone will agree with it, that we will work so much on life cycle cost analysis uh, that you know these questions will become a question of the past. But it's a good question, all right. And I hope it's been answered. Thank you. Um, then I have a question regarding um the conditions i mean we uh, one person is asking uh, specifically about dubai for example you have locations which are on the on the coast uh, the, the the palm jumeirah where you have a high uh, humidity but you have also locations which are more in the in the inland uh, on the on the desert side which do not see that uh, high level of of humidities um how can we how can we 
deal with that. I mean, now we are looking at, at the at the climate data of one city, but even within a city, it can be very diverse. Um, I I guess we can only go as close as possible and be as best, try to be as as as, as best, but we cannot we can never cover everything hundred for hundred percent. What do you think about that, uh, PK? So you know, give 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 the credit to the designers in any part of the world. I would say the local design in Abu Dhabi or Alain or Palm Jumeirah, it has to be looked in by the local designers and say, this is where the question of mandatory comes in. You know, don't mandate something just blindly. The 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 request for labeling and all these things, good things, come from the fact that this is going to do good not only to that particular property but to the society as at a large so if you are designing the same project say for instance in palm jumeirah and in alain alain is a hot and dry place you would go for plate heat exchanges you would go for that system where you had basically some kind of uh, recycled water first cooling the plate heat exchanger throwing it out so it does not mix with the fresh air, the fresh air coming through a cooled plate heat exchanger and then getting into space. You know, these are the innovations and uh, the journey for this particular energy recovery may be quite old, but it, it has received the right emphasis now with increased ventilation requirements you know no longer is it good to go and close the fresh air in order to reduce loads you know those days are virtually gone especially in advanced economies or in economies that are willing to take care of these good installations so yes i'm to say i give it to the fact that palm jumeirah and elaine it's not the same, but all said and done, when we embark on the journey, we will reach there where we'll be able to distinguish between these two. Look at India. As far as ASHRAE is concerned, we are region zero or region one. We are either hot or humid or we are hot and dry. But we have areas which are mountain tops, which have very good climate. And, you know, we have done the exceptions. So having good people on board all across, <clears throat> these points will certainly be discussed and thrashed off. I hope I've answered the question, Marcus. Thank you, PK. Um, a very interesting question, uh, I'm sure for you, Sullivan, but I uh, will give it to, to Pedro. Which third yeah. party is more stringent, Eurovent or HRI? I guess it's sorry, sorry, we'll do it again. Which which uh, third party certification is more stringent, Eurovent or HRI? And uh, that as you are coming from a manufacturer, I think you are more impartial to answer the question. Eurover for sure. I don't want to go too deep in that question, but Eurova is a much more uh, complete and much more. Uh, 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 what's the correct word? Let me think. More fair, because our manufacturers what we want is a fair, fair system. Okay, and uh, I believe it. Uh, Europa is 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 uh, is hard to, to to achieve and to maintain. Uh, so, I think that is what the the market uh, need uh, is a kind of that. But uh, I don't want to to be an 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 a route for the other the other certification, of course. But uh, is you is you European and you know do you know the the ones that is saying that European is a lot of standards and European market we fulfill all of them. So it's our way of working a little bit. I think it's always. Sorry. It's always to understand each certification program on its own, what it certifies uh, and how to apply it. So I think this is a, uh, a question which, which uh, should be uh, standing and the, the request would be everybody needs to, every designer and every user needs to, needs to look into that very well. 
and understand it to know what is certified and how, how much I can do with the certification. Um, one last question before we come to the end. Um, there's one person, I'm currently working in Africa, in Somalia, Mogadishu, and the relative humidity is 72% with temperature of 31 degrees. Is there any advice on how to bring down the humidity and maintain a 24 degree uh, level in a dry warehouse? I guess this is uh, relatively easy to, to answer, uh, PK. Yeah, I mean to say, you know, uh, just dehumidifying on the cooling coil is not the best way to bring down the humidity. And so cooling coils are there to dehumidify your air, but you must use something which takes out the moisture from the air before it goes to the cooling coil. And uh, if it is a dry warehouse, it takes time to dry. It. And I'm sure the warehouse will require fresh air. You know, it's not that it is uh, a warehouse where which can do without fresh air. If it can do without fresh air, it's a different story altogether. But if it needs fresh air, then whatever fresh air you are putting it into the warehouse, make sure that that is going out in a proper exhaust screen, which you are using basically to use a heat wheel or to use a energy recovery wheel to dry away that coil on the return path and the fresh air that is coming is being dehumidified to the best extent by that enthalpy wheel. Try it out. I'm to say uh, I have seen uh, important companies which today manufacture for low humidity regions. You know, low humidity things are going to be very important in future to come. The places where you assemble lithium and do lithium battery work, it's all low humidity places. So imagine when we get into, uh, into cars which are electrically driven, I have to say, if you are working on lithium and lithium batteries, you will need the same thing as the gentleman in Mogadishu needs, right? So start looking at alternate technologies. And I'm sure people will say that, uh, can we sort of uh, cool it down to a point and then, you know, what happens to the dew point and again, humidify, dehumidify. The local colleges have to come in. I'm to say every place in the world today has come to a point where not only there is the industry, but there is academia. You know, and academia sitting at one place, say for instance, in France or Germany or Portugal, can't decide what Mogadishu needs. So you should be able to have a round table or a forum where these kind of questions can come and the round table can keep advising each other and we can all progress. That's my answer, to it, long and short. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, PK. Um, well, ultimate question, uh, Sylvain, is there any limitation on the size of air, air handling units uh, which we certify, like capacity-wise, what are the ranges uh, up to which size can we certify? Yes, uh, basically we are limited because we are uh, um, looking at uh, and we are using tests in independent laboratories so it means that if we want to certify a unit we have to be able to certify and to test um, this unit in an independent labs and so we have some uh, limitations uh, but basically um, we can test the, the main ranges uh, um, that uh, you can have on the market which is from 5,000 to 15,000 um, cubic meter per hour these are uh, certified for higher uh, rates uh, it's a bit uh, more difficult uh, but uh, you can uh, you can rely on the and check uh, with the manufacturers what is certified and what is not um, again uh, the best uh, is to rely on certification third-party certification uh, from an accredited body 
but for extreme cases you could rely if certification certification doesn't cover it you can rely on independent tests from independent labs and if it's not possible you can rely on uh, tests in uh, participant labs um, to um, to get uh, accurate data Martin, but we are covering the the large majority of the of the cases Mark, basically can i add something to that question okay Perfect. so uh, what Silva said was about the the size of the units that could be tested, okay? But about the units that is certified, the the airflows could be higher because the software is tested and it's possible to compare the performance of big units with small units. is a question of maths and uh, equations, and in the end, uh, is not test in the lab a huge unit because there are no labs that could uh, do the tests but it's possible to to have to check the the big units uh, when i said big is a really huge unit uh, comparing with the uh, units already test smaller one i think that okay. is complete a little bit the answer of Silva. yes you're right pedro yeah. Then, uh, thank you very much. Um, we are uh, five minutes uh, over our time limit for today's webinar, so I would like to uh, emphasize we have we've received a lot more questions um, for this uh, topic. As we always do, we will uh, share these questions with our speakers and uh, we, we encourage them that, uh, that we will provide um, one-on-one -on -one answers to to the people directly. Uh, it would be always nice to have hours uh, for discussion and for for dealing with uh, specific questions. There are some very nice ones, uh, but uh, unfortunately for a public webinar, this is not possible. So uh, please uh, give us a few days of time and uh, be sure that uh, someone of the speakers and someone of us will take care that uh, an answer is provided. I also want to uh, stress again that we will uh, make the handouts or the, the presentations available by uh, PDF uh, to be downloaded from the website and we will uh, send a notification to all our attendees once that is uh, live. We also would um, would publish the recordings of the of the presentation on our YouTube channel. However, because of the technical interruption, unfortunately today, uh, we have to figure out how we do that because uh, it makes no sense to to upload a recording when you have such a, a big uh, a glitch in it. So, but we also see that we have received quite a strong interest. So, I would even consider that we repeat this webinar uh, on another date, maybe in uh, in a month or so, or one or six weeks, so that also uh, those uh, who registered but could not attend today have the chance to to follow it. And whoever is then interested to join us again is uh, will be very welcome to it. I would uh, kindly ask uh, the speakers that uh, you stay with me, please, uh, until the end of the uh, the webinar, so that we can exchange on that. And let's uh, move towards the end. I would like to give a brief uh, summary. So we are looking at various factors influencing energy efficiencies of air handling units in hot and humid. Uh, climates. Uh, the, these are specifically energy recovery, but also in the future then adiabatic cooling and the bypass mode. Uh, why do we need this dedicated label? I think energy efficiency is, is, is important enough that we have to provide uh, uh, tools to the markets uh, where they can compare products amongst each other. Energy efficiency classification is one of such tools where you can say, okay, you have such requirements, you will get various offers from different manufacturers. And if you are really interested to get the most efficient one or the, uh, a more efficient one, then you can compare uh, the products based on an uh, energy label. If this energy label then is specifically designed for, to accommodate the design conditions of your project, I think it's uh, really helpful. Uh, the benefits, of course, is this comparability but it also saves you money and time when you when you try to figure out what is the best option for you to go with. Um, we have talked about uh, th third-party certification uh, as an 
industry association, I would like to underline this uh, this message once more. I think uh, independent third party certification is a, a, a major tool in order to uh, improve energy efficiency because it makes the claims of manufacturers transparent and reliable. Uh, it gives you this comparability and you have the chance to not only choose the functions of a unit, but you can also choose then the energy performance. And from a market surveillance perspective, I believe third party certification is also a good solution. We are talking about a product which is so uh, complex and individual based on the requirements, on the configurations, on the location it's used, that it, is, it will be impossible to, to come up with a, with a one off uh, uh, test which tells you all. So, uh, having a, a third or using, making use of third party certification is also. A solution to have a, a form of market surveillance in place if you have a technical regulations for ventilation or for air handling units. With this, um, I would like to uh, highlight that uh, again our YouTube channels. Please uh, watch out for Eurovent and Eurovent Middle East YouTube channels. We always re uh, publish our recordings from the webinars. You will find a lot of more content uh, on those uh, channels. And we would like to uh, ask you to follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, we have uh, three different accounts here, Eurovent account, we have a Eurovent Middle East LinkedIn profile and a Eurovent certification profile on LinkedIn. I would recommend to follow all three of them. Uh, we use them as our main communication channel. So whenever we have another event coming up, you will see that uh, posted on our LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for uh, your contributions to uh, today. Uh, specifically our speakers, but also the audience, which came up with a lot of good questions. Um, please be patient for and let us uh, give us a few days to answer them. And I'm looking forward to see you in one of our next events. So thank you very much. I wish you a great day wherever you are. Thank you for joining in and have a good day. Thank you. And uh, forgot, thanks to our media partner, Climate Control Middle East, of course, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Good. Bye. Uh. Stop. Look.